little about a gram earlier, just to, you know, just to get going. Well, that's uh, yeah, I, I microdose daily. Yeah, ladies I, and gentlemen, actually, welcome. I had a ketamine shot yesterday, my monthly okay. ketamine shot, and uh, so I'm feeling pretty good, but I still have some pains. But at least I know where they come from now. And uh, that's right. I'm that's off right. Of medicine. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the True Life Podcast. I hope everybody's having a beautiful day. I got a great show for you today. The uh, one and only Mark Rose, activist for cannabis, psychedelic law reforms, entrepreneur, founder of Grateful Meds. But beyond all of that, he's, he's someone that embodies the spirit of activism. And I think in the world today, like I know myself, I look up to you, man. I see the things that you've done and I see the strategies that you use. And I think that the world we're in today, especially in the psychedelic scene, is really missing a little flavor of that. And that's why I want to reintroduce you to maybe some of the new kids coming up that may be looking for an avenue. Maybe some of the kids that didn't fit in or are looking for an avenue or see some injustice out there, or see some you know, want to push back a little bit. Like I think that's a big part of this movement. And I think that you're a big part of that, Mark, in your career. And so I just kind of wanted to throw it to you to maybe introduce yourself and uh, just ask you how you're doing, man. Thanks for being here. Hey. Yeah, I'm Mark Rose. I, uh, I'm doing very well. I just had a ketamine injection yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, I'm doing great. Uh, uh, I guess I grew up in Toledo, Ohio, uh, Rust Belt town. Uh, I left there about 1978 to join the um, force and uh, went to the medical squadron, but I got arrested for four flakes of marijuana and got kicked out. <laughs> they didn't find the pound. <laughs> 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 and uh, then I came to Boulder. And uh, when, I, when I was young in the 70s in Toledo, my cousins were a lot older. So... They were kind of hippies. And uh, so I was turned on to that life at an early age and was very interested uh, around eight, nine, ten. I, I was reading stuff about Leary, all that, you know. And uh, and then one time, in, uh, it was 1972, I was watching the news with my parents. And uh, they said, oh, don't go to Cullen Park. It's a literal drugstore of marijuana and da-da-da-da. I, you know, I excused myself and got on my bike and drove out to Cullen Park. <laughs> rode out to Cullen Park. I love it. And, uh, you know, I was a paper boy. So I uh, was looking for some uh, marijuana. And uh, I went up to this car that was from Michigan. And uh, I said, hey, you guys got any uh, marijuana? They said, no, but we have orange sunshine. And uh, I said, what's that? And they go, LSD 25. I said, how much will $30 give me? <laughs> and they just poured it into my hands. And uh, and I was like, and we experienced, I experienced that with friends. And uh, a lot of them didn't have a positive experience from it. Uh, maybe they just weren't ready. I don't know. We were very young. I right. got to say that. Maybe too young for some maybe. people. But uh, for me, uh, being a... Uh, survivor of uh, sexual abuse as a kid, uh, holding a lot of trauma, uh, generational trauma, over and over, you know? Uh, L you know, LSD, mescaline, things like that, uh, it helped me to cope. I was happy, you know? And before that, you know, I had psychiatrists experimenting my brain at 10 years old. And uh, every time I've ever taken a medication uh, from a psychiatrist, it has flipped me out. And uh, that happened to me just recently because I was trying to uh, obtain escaketamine. Hmm. And the FDA, uh, their wisdom, uh, you know, says, oh, you can't prescribe that without uh, also prescribing an SSRI medication. So, the, you know, they were putting me on an SSRI so I get approved for uh, escaketamine so it, I could kind of microdose between the peaks and valleys of the ketamine. And uh, that just flew me out of my mind. 
And it's taken me about three months to regain that. And, uh, and that's, that's the problem with psychiatry, in my opinion, is they're experimenting on it. It's constant. And there's so many natural medicines to help us. You know, and, you know when, I, when I worked in medicine, the, the first, you know, and, you know, no doctor, I was a technologist, that sort of thing. But the first thing you're always taught is the patient knows their body the best. And, you know, you just need to get a good history out of them. Uh, but medical world seems to have forgotten that. Uh, my last job was, uh, you know, uh, basically keeping mental health patients holds from escaping the emergency room. And uh, I took that job kind of like as just to see what was going on in the hospital world. again. And uh, cause I had been out of it for about 10, 15, 20 years, maybe. And I was appalled. I was appalled. The lack of compassion, the lack of compassion and the, the injecting him with these drugs that just made him worse. And uh, when every one of them, you know, I can't believe it. They're coming in suicidal. Why not give them a shot of ketamine? It takes away 100 uh, percent suicidal ideations. It helps with depression 80 percent of the time. You know, these people could be walking out cured, not cured, but helped. Right. Helped. Right. And because you, you always need, you know, the aftercare, the integration, all that, and which is something I'm just learning myself. And uh, but, you know, I got to get I got to give big props to the uh, the brotherhood of eternal love uh, that I consider bodhisattvas uh, slash smugglers. And I, and I think thank these guys so much. I thank them so much. Because they're they were responsible for my first psychedelic experience, and uh, you know they tried to turn on the world, and we wouldn't be here without them today with the psychedelic renaissance. And uh, but you know because they don't have degrees or they don't have this or that, they're being overlooked, and uh, and their wisdom is so great, and uh, it, I think it's a shame. I just think it's a shame. And, uh, you know, and I, I also want to give a shout out to my daughter. I'm going to be going to her graduation here uh, out in uh, Hayward. She's becoming a chiropractor uh, specializing in women's health. So anyway. Oh, yeah. And I'd like to uh, acknowledge uh, Tina Turner. Mm. Uh, May she rest in power. Mm. Uh, I've never seen a. She's got to be the most greatest example of a transformation of a human being in my lifetime i am not kidding you. uh you know going from sex you know sexual abuse getting shot at all that crap you know to becoming a buddhist and and being peaceful with it at the end i i listen to her sing sutras every mm. morning i didn't yeah. know she did that that's amazing she does, she does. had yeah she's got uh, several videos on that and uh you know and and that's just it you know a lot of people some people can get there without psychedelics many can't uh but they're just a tool in the tool belt you know right and uh and you know my motivation is the same when it was with cannabis back in 2009 or whatever when i started going down the legislature and talking whatever uh, you know, it's an injustice, man, to keep this stuff illegal. It's it's just an injustice. And, uh, you know, this country grew huh, from the very beginning, the very beginning, uh, brought it back in World War One, brought it back in World War Two. You know, what is the deal, man? And then with psychedelics, they were, you know, Bill W. from mm -hmm. uh, Alcoholics, Alcoholics Anonymous. Was advocating the use of LSD in the 1950s to cure alcoholics. I, you know, there's so much wisdom that we have lost. Yeah, yeah, it's it's that's it's all true. On the topic of Tina Turner, simply the best, right? I mean, she yeah, said it absolutely. herself. Absolutely. The, the the brotherhood. You know what an amazing story 
of which most people will only remember the words orange sunshine. But, you know, I'm sure that there are some, you know, storytellers around that could talk about some of the transformations that happened. And they, they themselves were like a trip. Like they yeah. were the trip that changed people. They were the vehicle sort of, right? Like they were spiritual warriors. Mm. They were spiritual warriors. And, uh, and, you know, I'm in contact with one of them uh, quite frequently. Actually, I just bought a uh, signed poster off of him. <laughs> but, uh, I've seen those, yeah. Yeah, you know, but, uh, and I, I'm just amazed, man, that these people's wisdom is just being overlooked. And it's, and it's got to do with corporate greed. Yeah. And that's what it's about. And uh, I'm really afraid that the psychedelic scene is going to turn in to what the cannabis scene turned into, which is a lot of pump and dump schemes, people losing a lot of money, uh, oversaturated market, and uh, boom, you know, a lot of a lot of dreams turn into nightmares. Maybe you could talk about some of the similarities that you see. Maybe we should start off first with let's talk about what happened in the cannabis scene because you were there. You were you were some of the you were on the ground floor when a lot of people came together and were. You know, maybe even trying to start a monopoly down there. Maybe you could start at the beginning there about the cannabis scene, and then we can you could walk yeah. it into what's happening with psychedelics today and okay. what's similar about it. I can tell you my story. Sure, uh, I love it. I started, uh, you know, I I've smuggled uh, cannabis my whole life and sold it. I, you know, at seventeen, I was going down to Florida and running you know, bagos back with my cousin. You know, uh, you know. After the Air Force, when I came to Boulder, I fell into this crazy, crazy organization where, like, you know, and traveling all across the country. That was my gig. And even when I started, the, you know, regular jobs, when I take a vacation, that's what I did. <laughs> and uh, but then legalization happened or no, uh, we call it legalization. Yeah. Uh, the Constitutional Amendment, I think it was Amendment 22. Uh, and uh, that you know went into effect in 2001. So, but it was pretty underground at right. that time. Uh, people were growing. You know, you had to know somebody. You had to get this license. There was one place to get it, and it was this uh, older doctor. Forgive me, I forget her name, but she's so wonderful. And uh, she was out of Westminster, and it was a group out of Oregon that that began that. And then. You know, I was growing for people and doing my thing, you know, as I usually do. And then two other dispensaries popped up, one in Colorado Springs, one in Boulder. And uh, I grew for the one in Boulder. And, uh, you know, and they were doing a great job and everything. Uh, but then we had this meeting down in uh, Denver, high rise in Denver, lawyer's office, uh, you know, the guys that past Amendment 64 were there, uh, representatives, I imagine, for the legislature, uh, about 30 of us growers, you know, basically creating, you know, they could have arrested us on a RICO charge, man. We were conspiring <laughs> to grow all the cannabis for Colorado. And uh, they wanted to make a monopoly. And I said, I objected. And there's there was another thing involved too. They were they were bummed out about my past mm -hmm. because you know we all submitted our rest records and this and that. You know, I got set up in the eighties, man. You know, I got set up like a bowling pin. I'm not kidding. And uh, and then I got busted again. Uh, you know, driving through Nebraska one time. Uh, but you know, such is life. Uh, and. So they were kind of like, oh, you know, what do you got to give to this? And what did that? I go, you know, then they're like, are you adverse to money? I go, no, no, I'm not adverse to money, but I'm, a, I'm adverse to injustice. Mm. And uh, they said, well, what the hell are you going to do about it? I said, you'll see. And uh, the very next week, I opened up Grateful Meds in Nutterland, Colorado. And, uh, and then started debating Boulder County's DA through the front page. Uh, and then uh, that turned into more, you know, press 
which turned into bigger press. And, uh, you know, it just grew and grew. Uh, interviews in High Times, uh, you know, mention in Rolling Stone, that kind of stuff, you know. And, uh, you know, a lot. But the problem was I was the only dispensary owner that was down there fighting for patients' rights. Oh, no, I can't say that. There was Josh Stanley who created Charlotte's Web. And actually, he asked me to partner up with him because we were kind of on opposite sides on like regulations mm. and stuff. I wasn't big on the greed factor, you know, and uh, and I turned it down, you know, and, uh, you know, and and, and they kind of want that side, you know, where, you know, our regulations didn't before that because how it ran. At first, it was a caregiver system. So you had to have, you know, people would write over a caregiver slip. You know, mm -hmm. I had hundreds of people, you know, maybe even more than hundreds. Because I had people coming from Durango, like all corners of the state, man. Because what I was doing, I had pretty much everybody in the town of Nederland growing cannabis for. Me. And uh, so I had a hundred strains at one point on my shelves. People would just come to see it or <laughs> see the, the sign Grateful Dead guitar, you know, <laughs> you know, it, it, it was crazy and uh, it was a fun time. Uh, but, uh, you know, the state decided on the model instead of sharing the wealth, they decided on vertical integration, which goes mm -hmm. back to Henry Ford, where you own everything, you know, everybody seed to sale, got to track it seed to sale. Mm. which cuts out a lot of side businesses you know in the beginning and and then of course they voted to kick me out uh and i think about a thousand other people that had similar records uh you know and uh you know clara lovey she was uh, head of the senate back then I, I can still i consider her a friend today uh, even though she voted against me then she called me two years later and said mark we fixed it we can get back in now I'm like, well, Claire, with all this regulation and stuff like that, you know, you got a million bucks to lend me. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And she's like, I'm so sorry, Mark. And I go, you know, maybe someday I'll call in a favor. Yeah. And uh, she's a, she's my county commissioner now. Uh, and, uh, but a good person, great person. Uh, and the vertical integration thing, you know, what that did is it just created, you know, the pioneers that came in that, that really were doing the work, they all got bought out or went out of business. Big money, bigger money came in. Now even bigger money's come in. And soon it'll be pharmaceutical, tobacco, you name it, beer companies. It's going to happen. And I hate to see it. I really do. Yeah, that's, that's the model that you know, it's this form of centralization and, you know, it's, I don't know. It, it's almost sometimes like the very seeds of destruction are planted in the creation of it. You know what I right. mean? And, and well, but it's interesting because do you see some similar patterns now that you've been through that and not only been through it and seen it, but participated in it. Now mm -hmm. we're seeing this next wave of like psilocybin, which is similar to cannabis in a lot of ways and that Absolutely. it's relatively cheap to grow and there's not a whole lot of regulations around it. And there's already this cannabis model that a lot of money interested to have found ways to, you know, get their hooks in or manipulate or change. Do you see something similar that could happen to like the psilocybin or the psychedelic industry? I absolutely do. And if it does, it's going to be a disaster. Mm. Uh, you know, it needs to be done correctly. Uh, you know, right now in Colorado, we can uh share psilocybin with each other at cost that's it's our right now dmt mescaline uh aboga which uh, by the way i went through the whole opiate thing i uh i fell 150 feet off a of navajo peak in colorado uh made a wrong move uh my friends say 500 but I kind of tumbled like bullwinkle down this avalanche chute. 
And uh, luckily, my pack cut a rock and stopped me before I was going off this thousand foot cliff into the watershed. I saw it literally saw my life flashing in behind, you know, my eyes, that sort of thing. Uh, wound up, you know, getting surgery, all that stuff. At first, I was getting raw to chiropractics, uh, maybe a little bit of uh, uh, lore set with, for the pain. But then the uh, my DO uh, retired because yeah, him and his wife broke up, right? So he just he went and he had to get get himself together. One of the best doctors I, I've ever known, Nathan Josephs. And uh, anyway, they put me on, uh, I went to a pain clinic, which as a doctor I worked with at Boulder Community mm -hmm. Hospital. And uh, I was probably one of the first patients put on OxyContin. And uh, I didn't realize how badly it's affected my life for a long time. Uh, as far as anger, as far as a lot of different things. Uh, I've been given all these medications that now I realize that, that I'm off opiates. I was given them to treat the side effects of opiates. And, uh, you know, opiates have their place. But let me tell you, for anybody out there who's like on methadone or suboxone or anything like that, because I was, and I had to go in the hospital. They're going to treat you like crap, my friends. They are going to treat you like crap. And the other thing is they're going to under-medicate because all your opiate receptors are screwed up. So you got to get off this stuff. And that's why what I did is I, I'm involved with that Purdue lawsuit, bank, you know, their deal. They appeal. I'm also involved with the melon crime. Uh, pharmaceutical lawsuit, they did not appeal. So I'm, I'm waiting on a settlement. Uh, I plan to use that money to start an aboga retreat here in Colorado, if I can, uh, and do it right. Because, uh, you know, there, there needs to be medical monitoring, you got to have screening, uh, you know, it can, you know, ACL loss training, therapist, a lot of aftercare. So it's going to take a bit. But Nobody else will do it because there's no money, you see, because, you know, it takes a lot of time to go through this, you know, and sure, you can fly down to Mexico, you go up to Canada and pay 10 grand, whatever. Man. Like, I want to give it to the people that need it, you know, that can't afford it, you know, even if I have to give it to them free. Yeah, that's interesting. Like, how, how how do how do you set up a model like that though? Like, how, I mean, is there a way to to? I I think that a lot of people would would agree with you that uh, the people that need some of the psychedelic medicine the most, the people that can't afford it, correct. But what, how have you any ideas of how to, you know, orchestrate a plan to get the people that need it? The medicine. What do you think? Well, for one, there's been an underground Ibogaine community, or, uh, which is derived from a boga since the 1960s, uh, late 60s. Uh, so it's not like it's not around. It's just we got to bring it to the surface. Mm. It's like I, when I told uh, back at the state legislator, which cannabis, I said, you know, let it, you know, there's this billion dollar industry that's under the table. You know, let us bring it above the table, give you your cut and come out of the shadows and be the good citizens that we really are. And it's the same thing. It's the same thing, man. Um, you know, why are we being judged to just trying to feel better? I don't get it. And this drug war, mm. you know, my cousin spent almost 16 years, I think, you know, I got another cousin that spent six, over six cents LSD that I gave him. That's some heavy karma. Yeah. You know? And uh, I feel so bad for him. But, you know, uh, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? You know, and it's just because of the laws are so different in each state. You know, if he would have got busted out in Colorado, they 
probably would have just laughed it off, you know. But uh, here, or out in Ohio, you know, six years in prison because he was in the wrong county. Yeah, you know, there's there's a war on drugs, but there's not a war on poverty. There's a war right. on drugs, but there's not a war on community. You know, it's it, it does seem to me that if people, and I think Colorado, Oregon, Canada, like these places are beginning to be sort of a beacon of light because I think the states are starting to say, wow, we can really generate some revenue from here. But there's well, pushback too. If, if like the pharmaceutical industry is an industry, you could make the argument that addiction is an industry. They like to, I, in my opinion, I think there's a lot of people that see the addiction model as a, you know, just, it's like a conveyor belt. The person gets better and they get back on it. Oh, you can't have any drugs at all. Here's a little bit. You're back on it. Absolutely. You have, right. You get someone with Iboga, all of a sudden you can wipe them. You can, you can take them out of there, but there's a lot Absolutely. of moneyed interest that want people on that treadmill. It's, it's creepy. Absolutely. I, I went through a rehab. Yeah, uh, maybe you can share one that. Of the, one yeah. of the first ones in Boulder. It was called okay. a, a day at a time. Uh, my, uh, I was working for uh, at Rudy's Bakery, uh, uh, who honored Swami Rudrananda. And, uh, you know, I went to Ba, and these people, they had the most, I always thought they were high on acid because they just had love in their eyes all right. the time. And I went to this guy and I said, man, you know, I got this problem with cocaine. He hugged me and took all that fucking pain and put me into a rehab, and paid for it. And, uh, you know, went through it. And it was just, it was just a joke. And, uh, you know, and, and then I tried it another time. And I told him, you know, I went in. <laughs> this is a good story. <laughs> I, I went in and uh, I literally freaked out of my mind. Uh, like coaching psychosis, right? And I walk right up to the psych ward. And I ring the bell and they go, Yes, I go. Let me in. I got a gun. <laughs> Let me in. That's so crazy. I got a gun, and I did. <laughs> and uh, and suddenly, you know, the security <laughs> comes and they let me in. And he says, "Well, can I have your gun?" I said, "Absolutely. I don't want it." <laughs> I said, "I'm just fucking scared." Yeah. And uh, I need help. And then they asked me for my insurance. I said, "Oh, it's Anthem. I didn't have insurance." So three days, or they come to me again. Uh, Mark, you don't have it. Oh, shit. It must have been this one. Yeah. Uh, you know, da -da -da, a couple more days. Then uh, they come again. Mark, you don't have, must have been this one. Oh, no, man. I go, you know, I go, you know what? I don't even care. It's been seven days. I'm back to myself. I'm healthy. I'm in my right mind. And you people are no better than the cocaine dealers. Uh, you're making a profit off of people's freaking misery. And uh, I truly believe that. I truly believe that. Uh, yeah, it's there's there's I think there's there's good people that are trapped, like on both sides. Some of the people that have an addiction are trapped, and I think that there's there's professionals that have maybe never done drugs before, but are trying to help people with drugs, and so they believe all the propaganda that was taught to them. Right. You know, they probably have a big heart and are like, "Oh man, I gotta help this person. I'm doing the right thing." Right. But they're not. But, yeah, go ahead. I agree, because, you know, like with the people that are being trained right now in MDMA therapy, mm. uh, part of that, to become that, they have to take MDMA and experience Good. it. Yeah. And I, I think that should be true with anybody that's guiding anybody in the psychedelic, that yeah. they need to be experienced with it so they can explain what's going to happen to this person, you know, and to explain that, you know, you can have a bad trip, but or a really good trip. It's all in your mind. It's like the, the way you take it, man. And uh, set and setting, so important. You know? Uh, you know, I'm usually more comfortable with it out in the in the nature, mm -hmm. woods, or with family at a Grateful Dead concert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's something to be said about, you know, who you're surrounded by. And I, I think that that is a, it's a good metaphor because – you know, your set and setting can not only influence your 
experience on a trip, but it also experiences the way you move through life. Like if we look back at our times and we were at our worst, we were probably around people that were probably pretty not that good, you know, or we were in a bad spot in our life or we were living with a toxic roommate or, you know, we were, we were in a bad set and setting. So I think that that method is something that transfers throughout life, whether you're taking a trip on mescaline, LSD, mushrooms, or you're taking a trip to Hawaii, you know, it's, it's that set and setting. Well, here's the thing is I was not always a good person. Uh, I, uh, you know, duality. Sure. I, uh, through my teenage years, I was happy man because, you know, masculine's around, acid, this, that. I'm medicating myself. And then suddenly it disappeared. Uh, cocaine came on the scene. Mm. And my, me and my cousin uh, basically were given a pickle jar full of cocaine by the Colombians as a gift. Uh, within two years, three years, we were broke. Mm. We had lost everything. Uh, they also robbed us when we you know, got a big load. Luckily, we sold most of it. But uh, they had hired a crew from Detroit to come down and rob us. And literally, I had a 45 in the back of my ear at 16 years old. And uh, I watched my cousin's sister's teeth get kicked out across the room because she wouldn't keep her head down. Uh, you know, and... Uh, we had to pay all that, pay all that money back. And, uh, you know, so the drug world, man, you know, it's dangerous. We got to end this freaking war because, you know, the greed, the bullshit. Look at Portugal. Mm. Like, look at Portugal. They've legalized everything. and Their drug problem is going away. It's going away. Nobody wakes up and says, you know what? I'm going to be a junkie. You know, they're recruited into it by someone. They're recruited into it. Or, and, you know, and a lot of it is there that they're recruited into by someone that needs a fix. And, it, you know, and it keeps going on and on. And, uh, you know, and the worst fucking dealers are the goddamn physicians that were sitting there poisoning us with Oxycontin. Uh, for instance, I went to a Mapleton pain clinic in Boulder, they took me from 30 milligrams a day of oxycodone to 180, 300 milligrams of uh, morphine, mm. then uh, throw some uh, soma on top of that and uh, had me like that for a couple of years, you know, a few years. And I'm, you know, I'm working and doing my thing, you know, because that was their theory. You could be on high doses of opiates and live a normal life. Well, then in 2017, when the heat came down from the federal government, said, uh, Mark, we're sorry, we're closing down. You got to find a new doctor. Uh, you know, on the, to, for a doctor to prescribe that, it was a year's waiting list. Any doctor in freaking Colorado. So they let 5,000 patients strung out. What do you think happened? Heroin, Heroin. is very cheap. Yeah. Heroin is very cheap, and uh, it's it's a freaking epidemic, man, that we need to cure. We need to cure it. And uh, and a lot of that, again, goes back to psychedelics. Because, you know, me getting off of methadone, if it wasn't for ketamine, if it wasn't for psilocybin and a really intense LSD trip, I don't think I could have done it. I really don't. And, or, and the other factor was when... I had the, the DVT and they put a pick line in my bicep to shower it with a clot busting medicine, right? Mm. And uh, after the anesthesia wore off, I uh, was in severe pain. And they would come in and give me 10 milligrams of morphine. Well, I'm on like what, 150 milligrams of methadone. So it's not doing a damn thing for me. It lasts five minutes and I'd cry for two hours. Give me another shot. Cry for two hours. They made me do that all night instead of the nurse calling a doctor and saying, your patient is severely undermedicated because that's how it used to work. That's how it used to work. But not anymore for some reason. And it's the stigma hmm. of opiate addiction. The stigma. And uh, we got to change that. 
we really do if we're going to get we're going to get past this you know and uh i think psychedelics plays a big part in that i think spirituality plays yeah. a big part of that you know i never you know my whole life i never really believed in god you know i i got introduced to the rudranandas in the early 80s i went and meditated in the ashram and whatnot and the swami like plugged into my consciousness right and it it freaked me out it freaked me out and i i laughed right but who knows what he put in there you know <laughs> And uh, and I'm glad he did, because now I'm I'm coming back to that, man. Uh, you know, and realizing that, uh, you know, there's a better way. There's a better way, and uh, a peaceful way. And but you got to push back, though. You can't be a victim. You can't mm -hmm. be a freaking victim. You know, you got to push back. Yeah. What do you think? Like going through what you saw with cannabis or even seeing the la the the previous resurgence of the psychedelic you know in the 60s and the 70s or maybe even the late 50s what do you think is different this time coming coming around america's consciousness world the world's consciousness actually mm -hmm. and i think uh people like uh, deepak chopra uh you know of course rick doblin mm -hmm. and uh others have uh, really helped that uh you know it's i th i just think that america's realizing that something is really freaking wrong and uh again you know uh gabber mate i don't know if you're familiar with sure. him, but he's got this new book uh the myth of normal hmm. and i'll tell you what it's it's so profound and uh it, it explains uh, so much, so much about why our society is so messed up. And, you know, and, and I don't know. I just, uh, I just really hope that we can get ourselves on the right path. Again, you know? Yeah, I think we, I think we are, but it's, you know, I once heard a quote that said, nothing ever gets better until you admit that something's wrong. But yes. in the United States, Look, we don't want to admit we're wrong. Like we have a real problem with that. Like if you admit you're wrong, you might get in trouble. If you admit you're wrong, you might lose your job. If you admit you're wrong, then everything else is wrong. Your relationship, it's really hard to do, but we, we have to do that. Yeah, because you know, you're you're stigmatized for that. Yeah. Uh, you know, or or belittled or whatever term you want to use, you know. And uh, you know, I can't remember who the quote was from, but something like uh, you know correct uh tr correct a fool he will hate you correct a wise man he'll appreciate you mm -hmm. and I, I i believe that you know and and uh unfortunately i think a lot of it had to do with the dumbing what i call the dumbing down of america mm -hmm. uh you know back in my day we learned civics social studies we le we learned about the constitution history and you know, I was big on that, you know, and uh, today, you know, in a lot of places, it's not even taught because they don't want you to know the tools on how to get things done, mm -hmm. you know, and the real way to get things done is you go to your legislature with the law already written. Basically, you give it to them, make some improvements. Here's my here's my idea. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's kind of how it works. Man. And uh, do the work for them, you know. Be assertive, you know, and uh, and it and it helps. It helps. Yeah, it's it does seem like a different time we're in. You know, if you look at all the corruption that has kind of made its way through the veins of the American body, you can see places dying. And I, you know, whether it's low income neighborhoods, whether it's you know, um, border towns or white communities in all over the communities all over the world are, are, or at least in the United States, like there's, there's epidemics of fentanyl, there's epidemics of poverty. And these to me just seem to be epidemics of corruption. Like they're all symptoms of the sickness that is plaguing us. And it's this idea that unless we help each other, 
we're never going to make it through. We can run and we can hide, but the truth is we are all sick. The society we live in is making us sick and we have to stand up together and fight arm in arm, whether you're black and white or gay or straight or trans or a whatever man like it's not that person over there it's not that guy it's not that girl it's not that minority it's all of us and we're all right. guilty and there's people that are making a conscious decision to divide us so they distract us while they take all the money <laughs> that's what well, i think man i can give you a, i can give you a good example of that please, I, please. I had uh i used to rent from this billionaire around mm -hmm. here i'm not going to name names so i don't get you know and uh, he, uh, when I was in a jam, he suggested I go see a, a realtor friend of him to kind of sell my home, right? And I, when I called the guy, I acted like I was the billionaire's best friend. And the guy opened up and like, you know, it started, yeah, chat, 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 chat. Because I'd known him for years, you know? Yeah. And uh, when we met at the house, you know, he's like, oh, it'd be great to get this, like, uh, you know, a cheap house, you know, this, you know, I'm thinking to myself, I'm living at 10,000 feet uh, bordered by national forest. What cheap house, you know? Uh, and, you know, and, uh, and what he was trying to do is skim my equity, mm. you see? And then, but he told me the story that how him and this guy meet every morning to decide, and he uses the billionaire's money to buy mm. up inventory of houses and they hang on to them until the prices go up. Yeah, and then they sell, and this is the problem in America. This is why everybody's homeless. You know, freaking greed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just it's out of control, man. That whole mindset of the, all those, uh, you know, I call them the uh, CU Republicans uh, back in the early '80s. You know, uh, their mindset that greed is good. That Gordon Gecko crap. <laughs> yeah, right, you right. Know? It's like, my God, man, it's, it's never good. It's right. never good. You know, like, when do you feel the best? You know, is it when you're stealing from somebody or when you're giving them something, you know? Yeah. Seriously. Yeah, I agree. And I, I, I see this awakening as if you look around the world or if we just take the U S for example, there is a lot of, people that are like, you know what, I'm not going to go work for this large corporation. And, and you know, whether it's the, the, there was a recent strike with the rail railway systems, UPS is getting ready to strike. A lot of these large multinational corporations that at one time were headquartered in the U S are having a difficult time, like Amazon warehouses, they're having a difficult time finding people. And they try to blame the, the people like, oh, well, they just don't want to work or they're lazy. But the truth is, Maybe the people should get a fair shake at what the corporation's making. You know, it seems yeah. to me there's been this ever narrowing conveyor belt of profit going strictly to the top and then getting rid of the people on the bottom. And there's solutions like if we bring in automation, why not tax the robots? Okay, Amazon now has 3 million robots working on the floor. All of them should pay a payroll tax, every one of them. And that money should go into like a freedom fund. And right. that funds everybody to help build this country. There's a well, plenty of ways we could split things up. Well, that's the thing is why everybody's so depressed and anxious. Yeah. We're uh, basically Uncle Sam's money making machines. Totally. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I uh, was working for a multinational corporation here be when I got hurt mm -hmm. uh, uh, for Jam Smuckers. And who basically own a lot of different things. You would be amazed. And, uh, you know, they built a, a billion dollar uh, uh, factory out here to make peanut butter jelly sandwiches without crust. Like, the, <laughs> how lazy is America become? You know? <laughs> I mean, it just blows me away. And here's the thing about, uh, you know, in Eisenhower's time, you know, after you made your first million dollars, you were taxed 90% mm -hmm. on the next million or whatever, right? And people lived pretty freaking good back then that were millionaires, okay? Then, you know, Kennedy cut it a little bit. It was like 50%, I think. And, you know, then like, you know, Reagan cut it down to like 20s, you know, right. and, we're, and we're like, you know, we're, we're taking away our money. And, the, and, the, and when it comes to CEO pay, 
back in when I was starting out, you know, the uh, executive or the CEO made a hundred times more than say the janitor. Right. Now it's about 4,000 times. Why is that? The janitor is still making the same thing. And here's an example. At a high school, I hired into Jeep Corporation in Toledo, Ohio. Uh, 2019, I hired into JM Smuckers at the same pay rate. Wow. Yeah. That's a long time. So, you know, what are we doing? We're basically creating this uh, this class of haves and have-nots. And, uh, you know, back in when I was growing up, my family was rare because both my parents worked. But everybody else uh, was living on one salary, you know. And uh, it's, it's amazing, you know, and people got by great. And uh, what happened to that, you know? And I, I think it slowly started in 1968. Mm -hmm. And it's just this gradual, like, like going towards almost fascism. And we're, and we're, all, we're pretty much here, folks. You know, it's like, <laughs> totally. we got to fight it, you know? And uh, it's not because, you know, who's going to win this, you know? Nobody. And, uh, and uh, people, again, it's it's expanding our consciousness. Right. You know, I like, you know, like Ram Dass and Timothy Leary, they're all, they used to have a board that would say, like, how quickly uh, the world would become enlightened, right, uh, after LSD, but it involved uh, dumping it into the water system, right? <laughs> <laughs> And, and I, you know, and like, hey, you know, drop acid, not bombs. Yeah, you know? I love it. I love the shirt. And uh, it's, and I, I believe in that. I really do, man. It's, it, you know, and it's not like you got to take it every day. You know, some people, you just got to take it once. Right. You know, and, uh, you know, and just realize you're part of a bigger thing, man. You're, yeah. you're part of like the synchronicity of the whole world, everything, man. It's just amazing to me. Yeah, that's one of the biggest revelations I think people have on psychedelics is this idea that maybe you didn't come into this world, you came out of it and you're part of it. And the people you see, you're part of. The, the tree that you see, you're part of. The earth you see, you're part of. And once you begin to really grasp that concept, the idea of greed kind of falls away because it's like you're stealing from yourself. Like you're making right. yourself worse by taking something that doesn't belong to you. Right. You know, it's, it's interesting. And I think that that is where we're at right now. Like there is this sort of race between, you know, consciousness and catastrophe. And right. are we going to wake up fast enough or is that wave just coming over? You know what? It's interesting well, I, to think about. I heard deep Deepak say uh, that we're at a crossroads right now. Uh, we can like sleepily, uh, be asleep and walk to extinction, sleepwalk mm -hmm. into extinction, or we can awaken. Yeah. And I, I, I truly believe that, uh, you know, we, we are there, but I also believe that they're not going to win. I think we're here in the last gasp yeah. of the dinosaurs and I love it. you know, they're trying, they've been robbing our treasury for <laughs> what, 40, 50 years now. Uh, you know, and their last gasps and all this stuff, these billionaires, you know what? We're going to get rid of these robber barons too. Uh, you know, because yeah. uh, that's, that's the problem with the world is we, all these oligarchs that are, you know, basically just ripping everybody off. You know, there's enough resources right. where we can feed everybody on the planet. We could like, you know, there's enough resources here where we could give everybody a salary where they could live. You know, um, mm -hmm. it's just amazing to me the, what we spend our money on a freaking war. War. That yeah. is, that is our goal. And why? So America's got some heavy karma, man. And, uh, and I think that's what's happening right now. And, uh, you know, we got to get rid of that karma. We got to listen to people like, the, you know, the indigenous folks from every country, their wisdoms, man, 
are just so profound. And, and for us Westerners to try to rip it off, it's just, it's bullshit. And, and, and uh, it just makes me mad, you know? Uh, you know, POD ceremonies should be left for the people that have been using them for millenniums. Uh, you know, unless you're invited into it. You see what I'm saying? If, you, if you're invited into it, that's a good thing. But like to go and, and start like harvesting peyote and do this and that, you're just depleting it, man. And uh, it's not a good way. Uh, if you want to experience mescaline, uh, there's ways to do that. It's easy to make. Yeah, there's, there is plenty of, of ways to experience different things. And, you know, when we speak about the wisdom of our elders, one thing that I see missing, at least where I grew up, is this absence of rites of passage, this absence of rituals. You know, it used to be that's the thing that the communities brought together. And you, know, you can still hear echoes of like a quinceanera or a bar mitzvah. There's still some little echoes of these things, but Bingo. maybe sort of a new, and maybe that's one thing I hope to see, and I do see it emerging in the psychedelic community, is people beginning to bring together community events where people can experience a transition maybe the first time they see somebody go through it and then right. it's their turn to go through it and then they're the facilitator it's like they get to go all the way around this wheel and as soon as one person makes it around now the next generation can make it around a little bit better and so like i Absolutely. see the wheel beginning to turn a little bit what do you think Absolutely. about that I, I i totally agree and uh for instance with iboga mm -hmm. uh in the country where it's uh comes from in africa it is a rite of passage to become an adult. You take right. a boat. They also use it for sicknesses and things like that. Uh, and uh, I think we've lost that whole thing as far as, you know, these rites of passages. Yeah. And, like that. and, and I think they're very important. I really do. I, you know, uh, you know, I'm glad that, you know, my, my child experienced a psychedelic. Sure. I'm very glad. I, you know, and, uh, you know, and uh, I made sure that when she, you know, I, I talked to her about drugs very early. I mean, from the time she was probably four, about, you know, not don't do this, don't do that, you know. Yeah. She got in high school, of course, you know, there came a curious time. Sure. And uh, their friends all wanted to do acid, you know. And I was like, don't go buying it. Like, you know, if you guys really want to do this, you know, let me make sure it's real. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, you know, they all had a good experience. And I don't think they ever do, they've ever done it since. But, you know, and, and it was up on my property, up in the woods, the proper setting, yeah. you know, and the person there that wasn't stoned to take care of them. And they had a great time. So, you know, uh, it's, uh, and what did it hurt her? I mean, she's, I guess that's graduated to be a chiropractor. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, you know, and, and think of all the things, that, like with technology, and, you know, the human genome, mm -hmm. all that, that we're all like seen, like, while well, I know. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's just amazing. Yeah, in in some ways, the 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 war on drugs is almost like a war on consciousness because it Absolutely. forces us. Like every, you can make the argument that every country runs on drugs. We happen to run on caffeine, stimulants, and alcohol. That's and these right. are drugs that make you be quote unquote productive. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like whatever that's supposed to mean, whatever yeah. sort of value productivity is, is. You know, it's it's it saddens me to think, but you can go to any union hall, any any break room, and any store and any mall, and there's a coffee machine there. Like, Absolutely. you know, what it what if we replace the coffee machine with some mushroom tea? You there know, you what go. happens when we start changing the fuel that we run on? Well, I think we're beginning to see. Yeah, exactly. We're beginning <laughs> to see this outbreak of consciousness. We're we're beginning to see this outbreak of forgiveness this all of a sudden overwhelming feeling of respect for the planet like and you know it makes the people that own all the rights to everything really nervous when of course all does. of a sudden you know and, and that's 
that's good. That that's how it should be. These people right. should be given the opportunity to apologize and and pay some sort of penalties. Or, you know, if they can't do that, then then the consequences for them, I think, are going to be dire. You know, I'm amazed that the Sackler family isn't facing the death penalty right now, in my opinion. Like, I think that they should be facing a jury of their peers and they should be forced to, you know, see the the pools of tears that their drug has caused to people in order for them to be so wealthy. Like, it's such a disgusting and they, display. And they knew it. All oh, they along. knew it. They knew they it knew all it. along. That's why I'm involved in that suit. Good. Uh, you know, and uh, it's terrible. And, you know, and Melacrot was even worse because when OxyContin had to change their formula so it couldn't be uh, tampered with, mm -hmm. that's when Melancrot, an Irish uh, pharmaceutical company, decided, oh, I want a piece of this action and created a uh, you know, the typical blue pill now with the M that's uh, yeah. fake, fake uh, fentanyl now, mm. but uh, was Roxy Codone. Mm. And uh, I've got evidence that, you know, they were sent going, you know, hyping up the doctors. There's, they, they had this like reggae song, you know, you've got the power in your hand, man. You can get them out of pain, you know, like the script pad in the hand, yeah. get them out of pain. It's just like, my God, man, these marketing campaigns yeah. to addict people. Yeah. To addict people. And and why are the drug companies on TV talking people people in to like buying some drug that they don't need? Yeah. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. And you know, it's taken me a lot of years to understand this because working in medicine, I kind of believed it for sure. a long time. I really did. And I still believe in a lot of it, uh, like sleep medicine, things like that. Uh, but it's been, it's been perverted by the drug companies. It's been perverted. And not only them, we need to get the DEA out of healthcare. I'm serious. Like they're a rogue organization. You know, who the hell are they to say? what your doctor can prescribe you or what he can't, you know, it's ridiculous. That's why we have the FDA, you know? And uh, to me, the DEA should be abolished immediately. You know, they're, uh, they're the worst, you know? Yeah. They, it's interesting to see how many people, like even on the FDA, there's a, there's a revolving door, the same that happens in our Congress, the same that happens with lobbyists. You know, how many representatives of, from, from Pfizer came from the FDA and how many go back and forth? It's just, yeah. it's just, hey, you pay me and you pay me, I'll approve your drug and we'll test it on the kids. That's you know, how like, it works. It's so crazy, man. It's how it's, it works. It's not you that know? much different than Nazi Germany if you think about it, like the same Absolutely. way they were testing on stuff, but now they're just making more money and they've legalized it. Well, you know, and a lot of those drugs that were developed in Nazi Germany, uh, we're using <laughs> You know? Yeah, it's true. We never stopped. Methamphetamine, all that kind yep. of crap. Yeah. You know, uh, you know uh, it's a bad situation. But the, I think the worst situation is, uh, you know, this whole thing with the SSRI medication mm. and yeah. trying to screw with uh, serotonin receptors and dopamine receptors and things like that. Because you know, they only block or, you know, release, uh, you know, or now they've got new ones where it's like a little floodgate, they say. It's like bull. Yeah. I say bull. Yeah. Uh, and, and how much do they help? Maybe 30% of the people. That maybe, are, maybe 30%. Maybe, exactly. <laughs> you know, where, uh, again, ketamine, it's uh, been shown to help, I think, uh, well over 50%. I mm -hmm. think it's closer to 80 Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't work for everybody, but uh, it's one hell of an experience. I'll tell you that. And uh, if you really want to go and see what uh, the void or whatever you want to call it, like, you know, I had a experience on ketamine, the complete loss of ego. I felt like I was going down the chute, like down a slide, you know, 300 miles an hour, right? 
<laughs> scared the hell out of me. All of a sudden, I'm just shot out into this universe. And, uh, you know, I realize it's like so great. And like, that's when I started believing in God. Mm. You know, I, I really realized it. And uh, it was amazing. The, the worst part about it, though, is I had all these revelations and I came back and I, I didn't go and talk to somebody to integrate that. Mm. You know, what a, what a freaking lost opportunity. Cause ever since I've gone to ketamine therapy, I've always tried to like go back to that and I can never get it. You know, when they, they, uh, they asked me how, how was it? I said, it's when my first time I went to it, the therapy, cause my first time I did ketamine, where I had that experience, mm -hmm. I got it myself and uh, a vial of it and uh, injected myself with uh, 125 milligrams. And uh, I am, uh, and uh, an amazing experience, amazing experience. But of course, then ketamine clinics didn't open up for about three or four years after that. So when I went back, went to a ketamine clinic, the first session, they asked me, you know, how was it? I said, you know, it's, it was like seeing a friend's hand, but I couldn't quite grasp mm. it, you know? <laughs> and, That's uh, a great, yeah. And, that, you know, I, uh, I know several ex and current police officers that are mm. in ketamine therapy. Uh, I think every police officer should be in ketamine therapy. I'm not kidding you, because uh, we have a real problem with law enforcement in this country. You know, uh, I'll tell you an incident. Uh, when I was 14, me and my friends were beaten by police for standing on a corner, which was kind of in front of my own home. Beaten. Uh, one of my friends, or two of them, were thrown in the paddy wagon. And they just emptied a case, uh, can of mason. And my one, one friend broke out, knocked the cop down and ran. The other one thought he was going to be a good person and sit there. And he got the hell beat out of him all the way, all the way down. And uh, in Toledo, when you went up, you used to have to go to this elevator up when you got booked. That elevator, had they kept blood all over it mm. just to freaking intimidate you. Mm. You know, and uh, this is the mindset of law enforcement still today. Like, we're the enemies. Uh, we're not the enemies. You know, you're supposed to be our servants. You know, you're supposed to protect us and serve, you know, and not harass us and kill us. You know, I, you know, when I was set up in the early 80s or late 80s, I got off because. You know, they were they were trying to bust us for the pot deal, but they, they played on the cocaine weaknesses. Mm. And the, they had a they had a snitch paid informant. I I hired him in my tie-dye shop. Okay. And I told him, I said, if you're my friend, you'll never break cocaine out around me because I got an issue. He kept asking me about pot. I said, well, maybe I can get you a bag. Oh, I need 10 pot. Oh, I can't get that kind of weight, you know, because yeah. you don't crap where you sleep right and uh and he worked on me for about a year then one day and he they moved him right in next to me in these cabins and uh one day we pull up on this mountain road and he says mark i need to borrow your scale i said why do you need my scale you got a scale because i need a special scale i said why is that he tosses an ounce of cocaine in the lap. and uh you know he goes take one and just golf ball size rock and I take it of course and uh, lose my mind completely and mm. uh, you know and then he comes and asks me for the cash and I you know you son of a bitch you know you yeah. never do that to me again I'll kill you and uh, then they go to my friend who was my partner and say Mark or uh, Rit or Hutch Mark owes these guys big money for cocaine and they're going to kill him but they kind of need a new connection. If you could set this up, that they're willing to squash Mark's debt. 
Well, when they would call me on the phone, the cops, all they would, I'd go, hello. They would start to talk. I'd click. It must have had a thousand of those. Click. I wouldn't talk. Hutch, he, you know, he talked, he did things. Anyway, we got set up. And uh, it was a big setup. We uh, were interviewed on KGNU over it. Uh, public radio station in Boulder. This is like during Reagan's drug war bullshit. And uh, when I got on the stand, you know, they're accusing me all this stuff, selling two ounces of cocaine to this undercover cop. And at the time, that was a mandatory four years per ounce. Hmm. And uh, I got up on the stand. My lawyer asked me one question. He said, uh, where were you, Mark, on uh, the state these officers uh, say you did this i said well i was uh, incarcerated in the gunnison county jail for driving without insurance for 10 days and uh, he looked over at the judge i said your honor they're lying and it was like boom you know this trial i walk out and i get re basically for conspiracy you know you can't win you just can't win and my my buddy who they destroyed, who was like six months away from a triple degree at mm. CU, did six years in prison. Hmm. Then did more because we we were like sending him acid so he could like like write it out. But he made the mistake of sharing it with a cellmate and who snitched him out. Hmm. And uh, so, you know, the drug war, there's so many casualties, so many casualties. And uh, so many people have been hurt by it. And we've got to end it. We've got to end it. Uh, like I said, the model of Portugal is there. You know, like, why can't we just open our eyes? You know, is it, and again, I, I think it's because law enforcement makes way too much money off of it. Seizures, mm-hmm. cash, all that kind of crap. Uh, same with the DEA, you know. Uh, of course, the you know cartels are making big cash off of it. Uh, who are also, you know, bribing law enforcement. Yeah. You know, it's it's a big game, man. It's a big game. And uh, yeah, you know, anybody that's ever been in it knows that. Yeah, it's hard to shut down. A, I mean, you. You know, you can't just shut down Walmart by saying they sell bad stuff. You know, they got a team of attorneys and you could right. argue that the drug war is the biggest multinational corporation on the planet. Like, you know, Absolutely. how are you going to shut, how do you, how do you shut them down? They, they own everything. And when push comes to shove and there's no money for a state legislature, who do you think's funding them? Who do you right. think funds the bank bailout? Like, who do you well, think funds the initiatives around the world? It's the cartels. It's, it's, right. it's the American cartel, the Mexican cartel, the banking cartel like it's all part of the same system man and they they are the ones the cartels are the ones that taught the billionaires in america how to dodge taxes down in panama uh basically offshore accounts all that kind of crap hiding their money everywhere you know uh and that's the problem you know that these people are so greedy they don't want to pay their fair share and they made all this money using our common, pub, the public commons, you know, our roadways, our infrastructure, all these things we paid for. That's how they made their cash, but they're not willing to give it back, you know, to help improve that infrastructure so other people can lift themselves up also. And uh, it's a real problem. It's a real problem. Yeah. You know, I was thinking about it. Wouldn't it be interesting, like, if you do legalize it, if you take a Portugal model, all of a sudden you take these people that are criminals and you just make them businessmen. Like, you know, why can't MS-13 be the next Steve Jobs? Like they yeah. are like these people have. If, if, if you just if we just oh, for a moment, take them out of the world of criminality. Like those people, there's some really good entrepreneurs in there. You know, well, no, they're brilliant. They're yeah, brilliant. totally, totally. There's no doubt about that. I, you know, uh, one of my old connections told he, he, he told me once, he said, uh, Mark, don't worry about it. You know, uh, once you've made a lot of money, you can make it again mm-hmm. because 
you already done it, so you know it can be done. For yeah. most people, they don't believe it can be done. You know, and I, I think a, a lot of times people are afraid to try mm, for the, that's a great for point. the, uh, the, the fear of failing. And I think trying and failing is learning. Yeah, totally. You know? Yeah. Uh, you know, it's part of life, man. And uh, yeah. I, man. I think that that's a huge point and it takes us full circle almost just this maybe the epidemic that we're all suffering from is fear. It's something that we're conditioned to. It's something that the, like, that's the reason why police act the way they do. It's the reason why, you know, criminals act the way they do. It's the reason I act the way I, it's the reason we all act in a certain way that is detrimental to our health is because we're afraid we're being threatened. But the only thing, you know, I think it was JFK who said the only thing you have to fear is fear itself. And if you can rise above it, it's difficult to speak truth to power, but if you can just begin to take one step towards that which you're afraid of, pretty right. soon you'll be face to face with it. And pretty soon you'll see that, hey, I don't really have that much to be afraid of because I got nothing to hide. You got nothing to That's hide, right. you got nothing to fear. That's right. And what once you open up yeah. and let let everybody know that your history, you know, uh, right. it's over. Yeah. You know, who cares? Uh, right. I'm me. And uh and and as far as speaking truth to power, it has to be done. It has, it to, be has done. to be done. I'm I'm doing it currently with Boulder County Housing Board because they're abusing the disabled, the elderly, and the working poor mm -hmm. uh, just by just lack of maintenance and craziness and seven layers of bureaucracy till I could get to the top till somebody made a decision. The only way I could get there, the only reason I got there is because I had connections. Uh, you know, I know Jonah Goose. I know Claire Levy. I know I've met Jared Polis. You know, uh, I've got connections. And that's the only reason. Otherwise, I would have been evicted and thrown down the street. And uh, and that's the reality poor people live on, is if they speak up, they're going to get thrown away. Yeah. And that's why we have so many people on the street. And and this is and and imagine living in a place where noises are happening constantly. So you got these constant sleep disturbances, right? Uh as a registered uh sleep tech, uh I can tell you that is very bad for your brain, very bad for your physical health, your mental health. It will kill you. And the problem is what will happen is you have a, you'll create a sleep deficit and your brain doesn't care when it reaches that deficit, it will shut you off. It, you might be sitting in your chair. You might be doing 60 miles an hour down the highway. It will shut you down. And that's why we have auto, you know, that's a big cause for auto accidents, that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, and these poor people, you know, they're getting driven insane because of their environment. You know, and and we have the money to make it better. I mean, come on, you know, all this infrastructure money that's coming in. That's my that was my point to Boulder County. It's like all this infrastructure money coming in. Shouldn't you guys get your house together before you start spending it? You know, because uh, seriously, uh, I think a lot of money gets wasted. And and I'm not like a conservative, I you know. I, but I'm a realist. I, uh, you know, I was a delegate for Bernie Sanders. You know, I, I truly believe in that, uh, you know, and, uh, with all my might and, uh, but you know, there's common sense and, and that's why I, I support Bernie because he has common sense, you know, and, uh, I'm so glad that people have finally opened up to him what he's been saying for freaking 40 years you know 40 years and uh and finally people are getting it and uh thank god thank god <laughs> yeah as we're as we're kind of coming up getting to land the plane mark like what what would you say to like a younger george or a younger mark like who's kind of coming up and seeing these changes happen 
Like, what advice would you give to your younger self? If there's like a younger version of us out there, what kind of words of wisdom would you give them that they could hang on to? Be true to yourself. Uh, you know, don't get hung up on what other people are telling you or saying about you, whatever. You know, don't get so hung up on like image, uh, you know, chasing money, uh, although we need it to live and be comfortable, uh, don't become addicted to it uh, because that's what billionaires are. They're addicted to money. And, uh, you know, there's good and bad drugs out there. Be careful. Be careful. You, Before you experiment with anything, do research. You know, uh, and know you're ready, you know, and set and setting again, but don't go into it haphazardly and, and don't abuse it because, because man, let me tell you, I've been through it. Uh, addiction, it's no fun. Uh, it's hell on you, your family, your friends. It's hell on everyone. It's hell on the country. And, uh, you know, it's just got to stop. And so, so please, please, you know, heed my words. Uh, you know, don't do opiates. Don't do fentanyl. Don't do methamphetamine. None of that crap. You know, if you want to have a real experience, take a mushroom. You know, seriously. Man, just mic drop right there. That was beautiful. It's 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 words of wisdom from a lived experience. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I hope everybody out there who listened to this enjoyed this conversation as much as I did, as much as Mark did. I got your Substack link down below. Is there any other place you want to send people to if they want to find out more about what you got going on? Well, I I do have a page on Facebook called Psychonautical Engineering, okay. uh, and uh, otherwise, you know, I'm on LinkedIn. And uh, I, I do have a sub stack. I also uh, write on the Daily Coast a lot uh, about psychedelics and other things. Uh, so uh, I went, had recently, I like I said, I've gone through some stuff the last five months, you know, dealing with things. So uh, I couldn't create a lot of content that I usually did, but I'm back on track now. So uh, look, I'm looking forward to putting some more stuff out. Yeah, me too. I'm looking forward for uh, to to be reading it and checking it out and further conversations with you. Uh, looking forward to uh, seeing any and all things that come up. And I'm really thankful that you're out there, Mark, doing what you're doing. I think that you you leave a trail of breadcrumbs for activists to follow and not only follow but learn from some of the the wins and some of the losses that you had. And that's that's really incredible that you're willing to share that i think that's how people get better and I'm, I'm thankful to get to see and be part of that experience man so thank you for your time here today uh you're welcome my friend and uh aloha yeah hang on one second mark i'm gonna hang up with the people but i wanted to chit chat for you one more ladies and gentlemen thank you so much for today uh, i hope everyone's having a beautiful day i hope you heed the the words of wisdom from mark rose and that's all we got for today aloha